Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us today for today's teaching slash discussion, What's at Stake in the Israel-Hamas War? My name is Persis Karim. I am a professor here at San Francisco State. Um, in light of the events that we're speaking about, I think it's appropriate to do a land acknowledgement as it always is. I want to um, say that San Francisco State acknowledges the ancestral homelands of the Ohlone and Coast Miwok peoples, whose territory includes what is known today as San Francisco and Marin counties and the indigenous peoples from many nations who live and work in the Bay Area. It's our responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native and indigenous peoples and the institution's history with them. This work is consistent with the university and its commitment to diversity and inclusion and is essential to human rights work across the world. We take this small step toward correcting the stories and practices that er erase indigenous people's history and culture and invite and honor the truth. Let me start by thanking San Francisco State Department's co-sponsors, uh, the Department of History, the Department of Political Science, International Relations, the Minor and Middle East and Islamic Studies, <clears throat> as well as the UC Berkeley Center for Middle Eastern Studies. This uh, program today is intended to provide information and analysis about the history of the current crisis in Gaza, as well as to potentially offer insights into the larger implications nationally, regionally, and globally to what is happening. There are many actors in this conflict and therefore we draw on the expertise of our two, sorry, campus faculty, Dr. Maziar Bayrouz and Dr. Mohammed, sorry, Mahmoud Monchipuri. Um, I wanna acknowledge the pain and suffering of the many people who have been lost, um, the Israeli families whose loved ones were taken hostage on October 7th, and also the scale of the suffering and death that is occurring in Gaza since the 151 days of the siege by Israel. Um, to date, we have a, a count of more than 30,000 people who've been killed in Gaza, 1,200 Israelis, as well as a massive loss of infrastructure and suffering due to starvation and disease. What we are witnessing, live streamed on our phones, is beyond horrific. Of the two million people living in Gaza, all have been displaced and have had to move multiple times. Every university, library, mosque, church, and hospital, as well as the larger infrastructure for life has been destroyed or severely damaged as a result of Israeli bombardment. Also, more than 250 people have been killed in the occupied West Bank. Last Sunday, Jan Engelen, the director for the Norwegian Refugee Council, who returned from a three-day visit, said this, I was prepared for a nightmare, but it is worse, far worse. People wanna take your hand saying, we are starving, we are dying here. On the same day, director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and a professor at Columbia University, Jeffrey Sachs, was interviewed at the Antalya Diplomacy Forum. He said, what Israel has done is a massive war crime. The US is the one providing the munitions every day to Israel. It's up to the US to stop this now. Israel will not stop it on its own. The US has to do this. The US and the EU are complicit in Israel's war crimes and cutting off aid for UNRWA is complicit in the war crimes. The US is in the hands of a powerful lobby which has supported Israel no matter what Israel is doing. But the American people are deeply upset and against what our own government of the United States is doing right now. And he continues, it's a shame on Biden, it's a shame on the European Union not to be stopping this war now. I want the UN every day to bring up a resolution in the UN Security Council. And if the US vetoes it, I want the US to stand in isolation in the whole world and bear the consequences. Today, 
I think we cannot and must not think that we can stand by as Americans, as educators and students and do nothing um, given the scale of the death and destruction, but also the longer term consequences throughout the region. So I wanna invite these two wonderful colleagues to share their knowledge. They're both experts in the region and um, they will be each giving a presentation and then we'll have the last half an hour at 5.30 for questions, which you will be allowed to put in the Q&A. So let me first introduce them in order of when they will speak. Dr. Mahmoud Monchipuri is Professor of International Relations here at SF State, and he's also a lecturer in Global Studies and International Area Studies at UC Berkeley, where he teaches Middle East politics. He's also the author most recently of In the Shadow of Mistrust, The Geopolitics and Diplomacy of US-Iran Relations, the editor of Why Human Rights Still Matter in Contemporary Global Affairs, and the author of Middle East Politics, Changing Dynamics. He's joining us on a sabbatical, so thank you, Mahmoud, for doing that. Um, and he's working on a book called Climate Change, Environmental Rights, and Forced Migration in the Middle East, which will be forthcoming, in, I think, in 2024 or 2025. Dr. Maziar Behrouz is an associate professor in the Department of History, his books include Rebels with a Cause, The Failure of the Left in Iran, and his current book, which just got published last spring, is about late 18th century, early 19th century encounters between Iran and the Western world. And it is titled Iran at War, Interactions with the Modern World and the Struggle with Imperial Russia. So I want to thank our two colleagues and thank you all for being with us. And we'll let you know when you can put your questions in the chat. Thank you, Mahmoud, take it away. Very good. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to uh, uh, express my deep gratitude to Professor uh, Persis Karim and also Ariana Nick for coordinating and organizing this meeting. Uh, I would like to uh, set up the predicate by basically start with three premises. My first premise is that unless the underlying conditions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are addressed, which is basically the question of occupation, violence uh, lingers on. The second uh, premise is that Israel's conflict with the Palestinians, ultimately a political one, is not a military one. And violence will continue until Palestinians' aspirations for statehood are recognized. And the third premise is that war is morally and strategically unsustainable for Israel. I strongly believe that this war threatens the moral foundation of Israel. Uh, let me uh, put some historical perspective here for you uh, by starting saying that, how did we get here? I do not want to go back to 1948 or the Ottoman Empire, breakdown of the Ottoman Empire uh, around 1919. I'd like to kind of talk about contemporary development so let me start out by saying that the root cause of the conflict today can be traced back to the 1967 war, which is also known as the Six Day War because it was a very uh, quick and swift and surprise war. In that war, Israel captured Golan Heights, Sinai Desert, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. Two important and profound implications flow from uh, uh, flew from that uh, that that conflict. One was that that war transformed Israel from a nation that was fighting for its political survival into an occupier. The second uh, implication was that we saw with that war uh, the we, we actually witnessed the end of secular nationalism, the type of nationalism known as Pan-Arabism and Nasserism, 
and we saw the emergence of the rise of Islamism. Uh, fast forward to uh, the uh, more recent uh, sort of historical con uh, you know, context. Uh, the most important developments of 1970s, probably in addition to the uh, uh, fourth Arab-Israeli conflict of 1973 was that Israeli uh, Egypt signed a treaty in 1979. Around that time, uh, we saw the uh, uh, the onset of the Iranian Revolution, 1979, and then into the 80s, we witnessed the departures of the PLO from Lebanon to Tunisia. And then the eruption of the first intifada from 1987 till 1990, that was an uprising, a, a sort of a non-violent resistance movement against Israeli occupation of West Bank and Gaza. Uh, we then saw the uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait that led to the US intervention in terms of liberating Kuwait in 19. Uh, 91. Uh, more developments in 1990s, with the end of that war, we saw the emergence of the Madrid, uh, Madrid uh, Peace Conference that laid the foundations for the Oslo Accords. There were two sets of Oslo Accords. There was the Oslo Accords first that started in 1993, and that was the first breakthrough in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Israeli talks, but Palestinians were represented at the time by PLO. And, and the first Oslo Accords were not about signing a peace treaty, but rather involved an interim agreement. But the most important Oslo Accords happened in the second Oslo Accords. That was when uh, the Oslo Accords divided the West Bank into three zones in 1995. Uh, the intention in Oslo second was those divisions in area one, you know, area A, B, C, they were supposed to be temporary. And uh, the idea was after, uh, you know, after a short period, the jurisdictions of those three areas would be transferred to the Palestinian Authority. But unfortunately, the divisions persisted. And, you know, we you know now we are stuck with the area A, which is administered by the Palestinian Authority, Area B, under the joint control of both the PAA and, uh, and the Israelis, and Area C, which is completely controlled by Israel. To give you an idea of these three zones, Area A contained 18% of the West Bank, Area B contained 22 that was the area that shared by both Israelis and, 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 uh, and the Palestinians. And area C, that is the bulk of the area, was supposed to be administered by Israel. This is a big, you know, this is a better picture. You're looking at area A, you see the patchworks and kind of Swiss cheese type of territory under the control of the Palestinians, only about 18%. If you look at the area B, you see that that, that is an area that is controlled by both Israelis and the Palestinians. And area C, which is the vast majority of the area is controlled by Israelis. And that is why the West Bank continues to be called the occupied West Bank as divided in these three areas. So naturally PLO, which was part of these negotiations and represented by the Al-Fat faction, accepted the Oslo second. But Hamas uh, in 1987, uh, th that came to power in 1987, the, the, the tended to oppose these accords because they felt like uh, that they are not getting a fair deal in terms of controlling the vast majority of the lands. Arafat was regarded as an outsider. His method of operation, modus operandi, was rather uh, autocratic. And he was, in a way, kind of subject to Israeli restrictions. And a lot of people in Gaza consider Arafat to be so called, you know, a sort of a, a subcontract of the Israeli deals. There was a growing disenchantment within the Palestinian Authority, also in the West Bank, despite the fact that their leaders actually signed off to that agreement. Hamas was firmly rooted in the hardship and poverty of living under occupation, 
and Hamas was doing a much more, you know, a better job in terms of grassroots social welfare activities than the PA, PA ministries basically operating under the Israeli restrictions. So in 1990s, uh, the, the most important development was that um, Israeli society also was divided. And most of the division in Israel was, you know, in terms of opposition to the Oslo Accord. And that opposition was largely framed in religious terms. The religious, you know, uh, far right nationalists uh, known as revisionist Zionists, they were against any territorial compromise. So therefore they rejected the Oslo Accords. The Labour Party, on the other hand, actually chose to, you know, sought a kind of a practical compromise. So uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat met in the White House in 1993 and agreed to continue this process of Oslo Accord I to see that through into uh, Oslo II. But unfortunately, on November 4th, 1995, Rabin was assassinated by a settler by the name of Yigal Amir. Uh, this is with the assassination of Yisrael Rabin, we have been watching the unraveling of the peace process. And this is a time, 1996, that Benjamin Netanyahu comes to power. He is a proponent of a revisionist Zionism. And Netanyahu, since the very beginning of his premiership, he has done his best to derail, to derail the Oslo Accords. Netanyahu actually looks at peace process always in terms of the absence of the violence. That is to say that maintaining the status quo ante. Whereas the Palestinians definition of peace has always been equality and just, you know, justice for the Palestinians, largely in terms of a statehood, the recognition of their aspirations for a statehood. Since Netanyahu came to power, we have seen the provocative expansion of settlements in the West Bank, and this is clearly in violation of Article 49, Section 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And today we are seeing that Netanyahu is talking about some kind of indefinite and open-ended military control over Gaza. Back to Article 49, of the forced Geneva Conventions, which is known as deportations, transfers, and evacuations, such evacuations, and I'm reading the text, may not involve the displacement of protected persons outside the bounds of the occupied territory, except when formal reason is uh, for material, sorry, for material reason, it is impossible to avoid such displacement. Prolonged occupation and settlement constructions are in violation of preemptory norms of international law. Preemptory norms of international law are the type of laws and norms that are not written, but because there is a global consensus about accepting them, they naturally are known as preemptory norms of international law. Based on this article, I have always argued that the only effective solution to the Palestinian is not military, but rather political. Let me get back to the Palestinian disengagement, the second intifada that occurred in 2000, whereas the first intifada was a kind of a, a, a non-violent resistance. The second one was, you know, in, in you know, involved certain elements of violence. In September 2000, 25, finally, Israelis decided to unilaterally disengage from Gaza. As a result, Hamas in 2006 won an electoral victory, and since 2007, Hamas has been ruling Gaza. Netanyahu, during this time, has encouraged and allowed Qatar to financially support Hamas in Gaza on the assumption that uh, a deliberate support for Hamas would weaken Palestinian authority in the West Bank. And if there is a division between Hamas and Palestinian authority, then Netanyahu makes the argument that we can turn around and say to the international community, 
you know, you know, we don't have any partner for peace. But he has done that with the uh, with the attempt by Qatar to provide since 2014 something in the vicinity of 30 million dollars a month to Gaza in the name of humanitarian assistance. This has been done with the explicit approval of the Israelis. That is to say that Qatar sends the money to Israel. Israel then sends the money to the uh, uh, some kind of banks in Gaza, and the money is then is used for humanitarian assistance. I want to move on because I don't have much time to cover a lot of history during this time uh, time limit that I am working uh, under. But I want to talk about uh, the uh, nationality bill, which was passed in 2018. This is also known as Jewish nation state law. The law contains three important elements. One, the first one says the right to exercise national self-determination is only unique to the Jewish people. The second element of that establishes Hebrew as the official language. And the third one, which is the most controversial part of it, is downgrades Arabic uh, uh, to a kind of a special status, which means that Arabic, which is a language widely spoken by, by about 1.8 million um, the Arab Palestinian, the, 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 the Israeli Palestinians, reducing that to a, a special status means that you're downgrading it from an official language to a special language. For instance, if you want to go to the courts you have for, the, for the legislative language or for the political language, you can only use Hebrew. You cannot use Arabic language. Let me let me uh, uh, go on to talk about October 7 uh, 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 attacks on Israel. The October 7 attacks on Israel by Hamas, uh, which uh, involved killing of uh, 1,200 people and uh, abusing and abducting more than 250 uh, others, according to Israeli uh, uh, officials, I would argue that the problems in the area did not begin with the October 7. There was a context that I uh, provided you with that context, but I know the events that happened as Professor Percy described them as horrific and reprehensible. Yes, uh, let's be clear about the fact that those attacks were horrible, but Israeli attacks on Gaza have led to the death of more than 30,000 people, two thirds of them being women and children. And we are talking about uh, ordinary and basically everyday Palestinians who are not members of the Hamas. Because sometimes when people talk about Gaza, they're kind of confusing Hamas with the ordinary and everyday Palestinians. The war has caught Israel at a very difficult and divided moment in their history. Netanyahu has attempted to change the country's democratic institutions into a theocratic nation, nationalistic autocracy. Israel is faced with democracy versus autocracy. And it seems to me that Netanyahu is actually moving the country in the uh, 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 latter position. Fast forward to today, Israel's far right politicians in the Netanyahu government, they have said that their intention is to demolish, eradicate, destroy Hamas, but that doesn't allow for any real socio-political reconciliation. If Netanyahu government agrees to any political settlement, this will go against the compromise that they have to make for the uh, annexation of the West Bank. In other words, any political solution and political settlement ends the annexation of the West Bank, or at least a de facto control or a large part of the West Bank. And this is something that the Netanyahu government and his right-wing uh, cabinet and coalition government is not in favor of that. All this time, we have seen the genocide uh, you know, um, allegations. And I want to start out with the idea of genocide is not something that was brought up yesterday or a few months ago or a few weeks ago. In 2006, then the US President Jimmy Carter wrote a book in which he said, Israeli leaders have been imposing a system of partial withdrawal 
encapsulations and apartheid on the Muslim and Christian citizens of the occupied territories. The driving purpose for the forced separation of these two people, unlike what happened in South Africa, which was racism, its acquisition of land. Amnesty International and several international human rights organizations, perhaps including ICC, they have actually described such deliberate targeting of civilians as war crimes, urgently asking for investigating the crimes against humanities apartheid against Palestinian. The legal case, which was brought up to before the International Court of uh, Justice on December 29 by South Africa, uh, actually alleges that the atrocities of the Palestinians against the Palestinians after uh, October 7, Israel is violating the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of the Genocide. The legal argument against Israel is exceptionally strong, as uh, Megan Stack says in an article in uh, New York Times. And she concludes that if the violence in Gaza is found to be genocide, then USA could be charged with complexity. And I, 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 would, I can argue also not only USA, but, but the European uh, community, which has been up until recently silent, can be also complicit in that. There are limits to military actions in the name of self-defense international law. Principles of what is proportional, propor proportional and necessary must be observed. I'm sorry, I'm just going fast because I don't want to leave a uh, little time for my colleague, Professor Behrouz. A just resolution, security for Israel and justice and equality for Palestinian, that is, that is to say self-determination is the only solution. Let me talk about briefly regional implications and I'll conclude with a few remarks that I have. Egyptians have warned against the so-called uh, Israeli plan to unleash a new offensive on Rafah. Egyptians have been very clear by saying that any attack on Rafah, which uh, is uh, giving shelter to 1.4 million displaced Palestinians, would be equivalent to suspending the peace treaty that they signed in 1979. The, the, the Abraham Accord signed between Israel and the United Arabs and Bahrain and some other Arab countries, including Morocco, could be undermined. Recent normalization talks, and that is a very important point, between the Saudi Arabia and Israel have been placed on hold because of the situation in Gaza. Proxy wars in the region have really not only expanded, but strengthened the hands of Islamists in the region, especially Iran. Further implications in the region, Hamas popularity has increased, becoming once again the embodiment of the Palestinian national movement. The real danger of the spread of the conflict to the rest of the region cannot be underestimated. Maybe the possibility of attacks against Hezbollah would be next in the cards. Trade disruptions in the Red Sea by the Houthis have been really disrupting uh, international trade. I'll leave that topic to my colleague, Professor Behrouz. Let me end up with four uh, or five takeaways, rather. I will argue that the war in Gaza is a moral and a strategic disaster for Israel. Secondly, it is not clear that destroying Hamas and Gaza and killing civilians could terminate extremism and radicalism. Hamas 2. Point, uh, you know, uh, 0 0.2 will be actually uh, on the rise. Israelis number three, Israelis can no longer ignore the Palestinian aspiration for statehood. There is in the last uh, 37s that I've been teaching Middle Eastern politics, I have never seen an international consensus in favor of addressing the Palestinian um, aspiration for statehood. And number four, US could and should put the pressure on the Netanyahu government to escalate the conflict in Gaza and eventually map out a way toward creation of the two state solution. Finally, if that doesn't work, I would argue that President Biden should take its uh, request in a direct appeal to the Israeli people 
and bypass the far right government of Netanyahu. And these are some of the sources that I've consulted with to give this presentation. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you. Okay, I wanna make sure that we get to, um, thank you, Mahmoud. Um, I wanna make sure that we have enough time for Maziar. So I'm just gonna hand it over to you, Maziar. Uh, thank you. Uh, allow me to thank the center for uh, uh, diaspora, Iranian diaspora studies and Professor Karim uh, uh, first and foremost. And uh, I thank you, Professor Munshipuri, for the great presentation. Um, uh, I'm afraid I'm not as organized as he is uh, in my presentation. So let me just pose some questions and come up with some answers uh, to those questions. Um, first question is, why did Hamas do this? Uh, why did uh, why why did it was a terrorist attack? It was a deliberate attack on civilians. Why did it do it? Uh, certainly, the historical context provided by uh, Professor Karim and Professor Monshipuri uh, regarding the situation under occupation is a uh, uh, is a good background for the frustration that the Palestinians feel uh, under occupation uh, and. Uh, uh, but uh, didn't Hamas know that uh, such an attack would cause uh, severe repercussions for the Palestinian population? Uh, and the answer is they, they did know it. And uh, they were uh, either willing to pay the price without asking the people and or they didn't care. Uh, my understanding of Islamic movements is that they rather think more in tactical sense rather than strategic. And the attack was a tactical victory for Hamas. Uh, it arrested, uh, uh, besides taking hostages, it arrested the Abrahamian process. And uh, 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 the, the Abrahamian process is an agreement between Israeli government and Arab states, all of them dictatorships. It is it does not really take the approval of the Arab street. That's a big, there's a big difference there between Arab street and the Arab governments. Uh, so it kind of uh, uh, slowed it down or derailed it for the for temporarily at least. The second thing it did was to put the Palestinian issue back on the table. That Palestinian territories have been occupied since '67. That the Gaza is the biggest prison uh, on the planet. Uh, that Palestinian children are being shot by sharpshooters. Over 60 uh, journalists have been killed since 2000, before October 7th, uh, and so on and so forth. Th that is not back on the table. What they will do with it is, uh, uh, what will, will happen uh, is another uh, issue. Um, the second question is, what is the state of politics in Israel? Now, Israel's uh, uh, Israel is a country that does not have a constitution. Israel had been writing a constitution since 1950s. The laws that govern Israel are either the laws passed by the parliament, by the par Israeli parliament, or the colonial laws going back to the British colonial occupation of Palestine. Uh, Israeli politics had become very much fragmented. And that is because the electorate is fragmented. That does not allow, that prevents a single political party to have a majority in 120 member parliament. Because of this reality, smaller parties, especially right-wing extremist racist parties have had the opportunity to uh, influence the direction of Israel disproportionate to their numbers, to the votes that they get, because they get into these coalition uh, arrangements and they force the hand of the government. And uh, the Likud is, the Likud party, the party of uh, Netanyahu is a right-wing political party and it is, ally, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, allied with uh, extreme right-wing political groups, smaller political groups. 
These political groups are asking basically if we are to believe Ehud Barak, the former general and uh, chair uh, leader of the Labour Party, they want to ethnically cleanse Gaza and the rest of the West Bank. And they want to recolonize Gaza, bring back the Jewish settlements, settlers. Speaking of settlers, there are about 500,000, half a million of them in the West, occupied West Bank. 80,000 of them are Americans. The Americans and the settlers in general, in the Americans in particular, are the most violent groups in, uh, the, in the West Bank. They attack Palestinians, they take away their land, they shoot them, they shoot their uh, stocks, they burn their crops, crops uh, they take the whole villages away from them, they fence it off, they take their land, they start building uh, uh, as they wish. All of this against international law. Negotiations with Israel has been going on forever. And the United States is not an impartial mediator here. The United States has been actually helping Israel. Negotiations going on and on and on while land is being taken away uh, at, at the same time. Even after, even after Oslo in 1993, there is no uh, prohibition. There is no a clause that says land cannot be confiscated, whether or not it is completely illegal. So, uh, the, 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 which brings me to the issue of Israeli security. Israel is a small country. We have countries that are much smaller than Israel, but Israel is a small country of around 7 million people. And uh, uh, about 20% of that population are non-Jewish, they're Arabs. Christian and Muslim. This country of 7 million is occupying a people whose numbers are about the same as the population of Israel. A little bit less, a little bit more. I think 7 million is occupying 6 million. I think that's a close number. This situation is unsustainable. Israel has the largest army military force in the Middle East. It has, it is a nuclear power. It has the financial and military protection of the United States. It's, it is under the um, uh, <coughs> nuclear umbrella of the United States. There is no country in the region that can threaten Israel. The biggest threat to Israel, as far as I can say, is the Palestinian occupation. That is the uh, cause of creating in the region and in the Muslim world beyond that region, resentment, anger, uh, and uh, therefore insecurity. The insecurity of Israel is the continuation of the occupation. You cannot keep 2.2 million people in a, in a space uh, 25 miles long and five miles uh, wide indefinitely. It is impossible. They are going to show reaction. And as the, as Professor Monshipuri said, history of this war did not stop start in at, uh, in October seven. It went, it goes way beyond uh, before that. I am not sure if the International Court of Justice will vote for war crimes or for genocide. Uh, genocide has a technical, all, both of these have a, a lot of technical and legal aspects to them. <clears throat> Particularly genocide. Genocide, I'm sure uh, Mahmoud knows better than I do, you need to prove intent. And I think the Israelis have given ample evidence of their intention, both verbally and by their activities. So we will see, we have to wait for and see if the International uh, Court of Justice will do its job uh, or, 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 or not. Um, the United States, however, uh, uh, is uh, definitely, uh, if, the voting, uh, if the vote of United Nations Security uh, General Assembly is any witness, is very much isolated today internationally. 
uh, and uh, nobody seems to be uh, to be wanting to uh, defend the position of Israel except the United States. Uh, and that, of course, is going to have some bearing, I, I believe, on the future uh, role of the United States uh, in the region. What is uh, the role of Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, in all of this? Well, first of all, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, uh, since 1979, this is 45 years, uh, has... Uh, uh, has grounded Iran's economy and has created uh, a, a theocracy uh, that is willing to use violence uh, for uh, to remain in power. That is that that is beyond doubt now. Um, much of Iran's uh, financial uh, aid uh, or, fi or, or or wealth rather uh, goes to helping what Iranians call the axis of resistance and what the Western world calls uh, Iran's proxies. Uh, there is no doubt that Iran is financially and militarily supporting these groups and training them. I think there's enough evidence to not doubt that. Not doubt that. Uh, but is Iran in operational control, uh, command of these groups? Certainly, Iran did not know about the October 7 attack for a very simple reason. Israel has penetrated Iran's security network, uh, intelligence network. And if Iran knew about the October 7 attack, 7th attack, Israelis would have uh, very easily found out about it and they would not have been caught off guard. Of course, there is news that the Egyptians told them but they 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 uh, they decided not to listen to the Egyptians, similar to what happened uh, in 9/11 when the Americans knew something was going to happen, and they underestimated the threat. Um, the groups that Iran is apparently supporting are the Hezbollah, uh, uh, some uh, uh, Ansar al-Islam in. Yemen, which is commonly known as the Houthis, that's the wrong name for them. Uh, Houthis are a clan uh, within a larger Zaidi population. Zaidis are Shias, but they are not the same brand as Iran. Iran's Shia Shiism is different than the Zaidi Shiism in, in Yemen. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the, the Houthis and then Iraqi groups uh, on both so sides of the border between Iraq and Syria. So let's take this one by one. Hezbollah has admitted that it is being financed and armed by, uh, by Iran. It is by far the strongest guerrilla group north of Israel's border. It, has, uh, it is better armed, better trained, uh, and more of a little uh, uh, organization. Uh, but it, Hezbollah is a Lebanese group. Uh, it has members in the parliament. It is a political group that needs to be answerable to the politics of Lebanon before any decision it makes. I do not think, I do not believe Hezbollah is sitting there and Iran can push a button and Israel says Hezbollah can, uh, can attack, will attack, will, will obey Iran's orders. There are, there, are, there are concerns that are local to Hezbollah and to Lebanon. Uh, and uh, 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 that's why I say that operational co command uh, is, uh, I, I do not believe it exists. Ansar Hezbollah, Ansar Islam, or the Houthis, uh, the war of, in, in Yemen predates Iranian revolution. Uh, it goes back to the independence of Yemen in 1962, the takeover of North Yemen and the toppling of the uh, Zaidi Imam uh, by Arab nationalist supporters of Kemal Abdul Nasser in Egypt, and then unification of South and uh, North Yemen after the fall of the Soviet Union. This has been going on for a long time. And uh, 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 it is a civil war, uh, first and foremost, which the Houthis have, uh, have won. Uh, they managed to ward off 
the Saudis and the United Arab Emirates attacks and capture uh, around 30% of Yemen's territory adjacent to the Red Sea. Uh, Houthis also have to uh, uh, be concerned with their own internal issues, with their peace process with Saudi Arabia, uh, and with their genuine concern for what is happening in, uh, in Gaza. Their attack on shipping, which the Americans and the British have, I mean, unable to stop, uh, is uh, said, according to them, will be stopped when the war ceasefire in Gaza stops. So Houthis also have their own issues and their own um, priorities uh, rather than taking orders from Tehran. Iraqi groups uh, may have more, may have uh, uh, received more influence from Iran. But look, Iran, I think, is very much, very happy. Uh, Islamic Republic is very happy to sit back and let them fight. Uh, let them fight the, his, its wars. Uh, they are the ones who are shedding the blood. Iran is just paying wep uh, uh, providing weapons and expertise. Let me give you one example. Every drone or missile the Houthis fire at shipping is around $2,000. Every anti-missile or anti-drone uh, missile that the United States fires is $2 million. $2,000 to $2 million. That is not very expensive for Iran. Uh, so uh, it, it laid, laid back, let them do their job, and uh, 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 let's see who wins, uh, apparently, is the uh, ultimate goal. One final word uh, about international law. International, I mean, I'm going to just step back a little bit from the Middle East and look at the globe. International law since the end of the Cold War is under genuine threat. The allies of Second World War came together. They established the United Nations. They established the convention, Geneva Conventions against torture, uh, against uh, ethnic cleansing. And, and, uh, and, and uh, in the 90s, uh, uh, they, they brought people from Africa and Yugos, former Yugoslavia to court for their atrocities. But it seems international law, the way it is being practiced, is going to be applied only to the weak powers and not to the strong powers. Strong powers seem to uh, think they can do what they want. Russia can attack Ukraine. The United States can break international law and attack Iraq. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people get, get killed. They can torture. They can kidnap. They can do whatever they want. And international law does not apply. Not one person was prosecuted for uh, the United States uh, uh, torture uh, and kidnapping after 9-11. Uh, Israel is doing the same thing right now as we talk, both in the West Bank, occupied West Bank, and in Gaza. Russia is doing the same thing in Ukraine. International law, the very countries that had come up with the idea of international law and global legal order are undermining it. And this is going to come back, not only to smaller, weaker countries, I believe it will come back to them as well in time. I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maziar, and thank you, Mahmoud. Um, we have some questions from the audience, the chat, the Q&A is open. So if you would like to ask a question, I'm just going to read the, them in the order they come. And if there's any duplicates, I'll try to combine them. But I think this one, this first one is for you, Mahmoud. Why are Americans, presumably American Jews, in a position to take land and shoot Palestinians? Are there American Zionists who are there to support the Israeli state? Uh, the, oh, okay. the Americans that moved to Israel are 80,000, I read the number is 80,000, apparently are uh, 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 in, uh, uh, they are also as uh, radical or as violent or as extremist as uh, the settlers, the 500,000 settlers who are already in there. 
their uh, their mission is to take the land away from the Palestinians. And they uh, uh, and they are doing their best to do that. That is why that is why uh, the, the, our president uh, uh, basically put some of them on the on the list to uh, prevent them from uh, uh, using banking system or traveling to the United States and so forth. And so, uh, 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 but I but I do not think that is going to deter them. Uh, we will see. Uh, you, uh, uh, more uh, uh, decisive action is needed if they are to be uh, stopped. They shoot people. I've seen videos that they do it. The Israeli police standing there, sometimes even helping them. Uh, there is no uh, protection for the Palestinians. They are not armed. Sometimes they, they use their cars to uh, uh, attack settlers. Uh, and then they get killed. Uh, how long is this going to continue? And for what, to what end? That is the question. Man <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, Mahmoud, do you want to add anything to that question? No, I think it was well said. I, 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 I concur with uh, Professor Behrouz that, that uh, most of this uh, settlers' violence is unprovoked. And the army is, you know, collaborating with them at times. That's, there, are, there are ample evidence that shows that the the army has been actually helping them to attack the, the you know uh, the, uh, the the original people on the land Palestinians yes um I'll also add for the questioner that the Israeli government provides subsidies for settlers and settlements to be built so it's a it's a strategy that the state engages in ways to make it enticing for settlers to go and behave like this because they're protected by the military and they also derive um, some subsidies for housing, health care, et cetera, et cetera. And having been to the West Bank myself, it's it's really frightening um, because they're like I experienced seven, eight year old kids spitting on Palestinians in the city of Hebron. And it was horrific, um, unprovoked behavior in Palestinian land. So I think part of it is, is there's no check on this. And it's also not visible to most Americans. Um, so part of it is that it's hidden from the international community. OK, the next question is, uh, I wonder whether professors think negotiation is even possible or under what conditions negotiation between Israeli and Palestinians might be possible. I find that both Israeli and Palestinians, uh, especially Hamas and their allies like PIJ, which seems to be in power of PLO now, both in Gaza and the West Bank, claim the whole area and no complement seems to be available. Negotiate for what? The Israeli government has repeatedly said that they do not want a Palestinian state. They are taking their land and they do not want a state, independent state. They won't give the Palestinians Israeli citizenship because that would undermine the idea of Jewish state, one person, one vote. So uh, negotiating for to what end? Uh, the only uh, uh, thing that uh, can influence Israeli uh, opinion, I believe, is either the Israeli voters come to the conclusion that this situation is untenable, that we need to have a party in political in charge in, in Israel that would put an end to this, like they did in 1992 when they elected uh, Isaac Rabin and the Labour Party, or the United States could pressure Israel to do it, like uh, it did in 1992 under H.W. Bush, the first President Bush. But in, in the United States, uh, both political parties are solid behind Israel, no matter what Israel does, solidly. And uh, the lobbying groups, of course, are a factor. Is pro-Israeli lobby is strong, but I think the stronger element 
behind support for Israel is the Christian right. They have the larger number and they have a larger uh, impact. Uh, so a organizations like APAC and the Christian right, they prevent American policymakers from coming up with a definitive solution to end this crisis. I know that they are keep they keep talking about two state solution. They keep talking about uh, 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 putting an end to this, but they have been doing this before. This has been said many, many, many times until they talk themselves to, uh, to losing consciousness. And uh, again, everything goes back uh, to uh, uh, occupation and violence and uh, until the next crisis. Yes, I want to make a, a couple of points here with regard to that question, such an important question. Uh, I, I definitely agree with Professor uh, Behrouz that uh, that U.S. presidents have definitely leveraged, but they have been very reluctant and shy to use that leverage in part because of domestic political reasons that Professor Behrouz so nicely articulated them and the, the, the APAC and other organizations and the Christian far right groups in the, in the southern part of the USA that are, are actually supporting Israel. But, you know, it's important also to remember that both leaders of Hamas, Ismail Haniye and Khaled Meshaw, have said on numerous occasions that they would go along with two state solution. And Ismail Haniyeh is the political leader of the Hamas. And he is the kind of the, the political side of the, the Hamas. He, they have actually said, if it comes to, to a state solution, they would definitely agree with that. So even Hamas leaders have sent suggestions and ideas and hints uh, to the effect that they're open to the possibility of negotiation despite the fact that they represent the resistant part of the Palestinian movement. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to the next question and I don't know if you guys know the answer. I wonder if you can speak on the application of is Israeli surveillance technology against vulnerable groups here at home now that Prop E has passed. Is that another Patriot Act? And I presume um, this is also related to the fact that the Israeli military has been involved in training many police forces in the United States, especially since 9-11, um, and that cop city in uh, Georgia is also uh, contracting with the Israeli military. But I don't know specifically about Prop e. Do either of you know? No, I'm not aware of it. Sorry, we we are not up to speed on this. Um, the next uh, question is, could Professor Beirouz elaborate on the military strategies at play in Gaza now? He said that Hamas is making tactical rather than strategic decisions. What does that mean exactly? Does the same apply to the IDF? What decisions do they make? And the second question, do we know if there is any pushback from within the IDF against Netanyahu's war? I haven't heard about any pushbacks against uh, Netanyahu from active duty uh, personnel. Some uh, former generals have talked about it. Uh, also, the, the, the families of the hostages are, uh, of course, for obvious reasons, uh, very much worried about the military tactics that Israeli government is using because some of the uh, uh, Israeli attacks has killed uh, the hostages. Uh, on uh, on Hamas, uh, Hamas's biggest card right now is the current hostages it is holding. And uh, uh, I think its hope is to come into some sort of a ceasefire uh, 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 and have some prisoners released and Palestinian prisoners released uh, in return for peace, ceasefire and release of the hostages. When I say tactical, I mean, uh, the, uh, this attack, although it was successful for a few hours in breaching the wall 
and entering Israel. Militarily, it has been a disaster, and it has been a disaster for the civilians. Uh, I'm not sure what Hamas, uh, Hamas thinks it, will going, it is going to uh, achieve uh, from this. Uh, is there anything left to make a two-state solution? Professor Munshi Puri showed you the map. And uh, if you look at the settlers' uh, locations on that map, which Mahmoud uh, did not have one, you will see that taking that 500,000 out of the West Bank, uh, occupied West Bank, is almost impossible. Uh, so if two state solution is not possible, one state solution is not possible, um, uh, ethnic cleansing is not possible, what is possible? And the answer is continuing education, continuing calm conflict, creating more reason for other groups to engage Israel, add to Israel's insecurity and to the misery of Palestinian people. Unless something drastic happens on the part of the world community, one cannot see how uh, in the day after the ceasefire, this thing is going to lead to anything uh, in a positive sense. Can I ask a follow-up question about this? There's a ceasefire proposal that's floating. That's a six week, it's a temporary ceasefire. I mean, do you really think that Hamas would be willing to uh, suspend, to give the hostages back and then start everything all over again? I, I just think it seems ludicrous to, uh, to expect that they would want to give up the hostages when you just said that's their, their ace in the hole, so to speak. And then what happens after a six week pause? After six week pass, they don't have the hostages and Israel will attack again. <laughs> I mean, uh, does Israel have feel any any type of uh, restraint in, in in attacking Palestinian population centers? So far, it has no had one. I, I I I don't think it makes sense what they are saying that the, for Hamas to release the hostages in return for a temporary pause that the war will start again. Uh, I, I said Hamas thinks ta tactical. I didn't say Hamas is stupid. So we will see. Okay. Uh, you know, I think the news that I heard today was that uh, there is no agreement on the six week uh, pause in the war. Uh, that's not been approved by the Palestinians, uh, Israelis have not sent anybody to Egypt because Egypt and uh, Qatar and the United States trying to coordinate such a plan and they have not been able to actually put a plan together. It may fall apart and I don't know exactly what the sequence of the events will follow from that. If I may go back to the previous question, and I think I agree with Professor uh, Behrouz that I don't know of any current uh, minister or, or current cabinet members within the Netanyahu government that disagrees with him with regard to the Gaza operations, but there are former Secretary of Defense, for instance, Benny Gantz was in Washington and spoke with the Vice President Harris about the possibility of uh, finding ways to uh, come to some kind of compromise. They're, in a way, they were, you know, he was bypassing Netanyahu, and Netanyahu was not very happy about sec former, you know, Secretary of Defense of Israel being in direct talks with Washington. The other one is that there are some people like former war cabinet members. I have the name of Gaddy uh, Eisenkot, who have argued vehemently against uh, Netanyahu's strategy of not negotiating with Hamas and at the same time making a claim that they are doing a uh, you know decent job of releasing hostages. And, and so he's saying that if you are thinking about releasing hostages, but simultaneously bombing Gaza and uh, Palestinians, you are dead wrong and you are fundamentally misguided in this approach. So there are some former members of the war cabinet or secretary of defense, so on and so forth, that are directly actually criticizing and castigating Netanyahu's approach to war. 
Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, is it valid to compare madrasas that foster terrorism to far-right yeshivas in Israel, considering their similar, similar levels of violence and hatred? I don't know if you can answer that. But... I do think you can talk about madrasas in general, doing this or doing that. Madrasas are a place where Muslim uh, uh, clergy are trained to become uh, theologians, to become teachers, to become church or mosque uh, uh, preachers and things like that. Some madrasas are uh, have been radicalized, especially after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in Pakistan and uh, and, the, uh, and the war against the Soviet Union. Um, uh, others are uh, not radicalized, like the ones in Egypt, for example. Uh, so uh, it, it, you have to go case by case rather than just say madrasas are doing this or doing that. Okay. Yes, uh, Thomas Friedman had a letter in New York Times, I think November 12 or 11, in which he argued that uh, that uh, Netanyahu government has been uh, investing enormous amount of money in religious schools. And, uh, and, and at the same time, you know, propping up uh, Hamas while also crippling the Palestinian Authority, the only Palestinian organization with which Israelis can actually directly negotiate. And so he has been criticized of the way that Netanyahu, mem you know, cabinet members have actually investing money on religious schools. Keep in mind that the person that assassinated Eshaq Rabin was a settler by the name of uh, Yigal Amir, who was a student of some of these theological and religious schools. Okay. Um... This is probably for you, Mahmoud. Uh, why haven't we heard anything from the leader of the PLO in the West Bank this whole time? What is his role? I presume that Mahmoud Abbas. Yes, you know, I think uh, I saw on uh, PBS today at three o'clock that uh, Mohammed Shatayel was the person who resigned uh, uh, in West Bank after the October 7 incidents in uh, a form of uh, being critical of Mahmoud Abbas. Mahmoud Abbas and others actually have uh, traveled to uh, the Saudi Arabia. Uh, there was an Islamic conference that pulled all of the Islamic countries together, ironically, uh, Bashar Assad of Syria and uh, Raisi from Iran participated in that. Uh, the, 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 and, and the Palestinians were represented by Mahmoud Abbas, who actually went into Saudi Arabia. This happened in, in November. There was a meeting in Saudi. So Palestinians and the Palestinian Authority in West Bank have been uh, active. They have sent a representative to the UN. They are just uh, all over the place to actually make a case, uh, a plausible case for the, the, you know, the, 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 the prevention of the genocide in West Bank. Uh, and and mostly in Gaza, and of course the settlers' violence in West Bank. No, I think they have been very active, but they're not visible because the, the coverage of the media is not actually zooming in on them. Okay. Um, there's a question here about, if there is no ceasefire, what do you think will become of the evacuated areas of Gaza? Could Israel commit a second ethnic cleansing similar to 1948? and expel Gazans into the West Bank or neighboring countries. I think this is happening deja vu all over again. The way that uh, the you know, uh, far-right government of Netanyahu is talking about indefinite and open-ended occupation of Gaza, it actually reminds me of the Yassin massacre of 1948. I see history repeating itself before my own eyes. And I'm saying that to myself, that this is not going to happen. It happened in 1948. It's not going to happen in 2024, but it is unfolding right before our own eyes. And this is really a big tragedy. And I don't know what's going to happen uh, uh, to Netanyahu government, but as long as he's fighting for his political survival, 
And as long as he is, you know, running the government the way that he's surrounded by far right, you know, ultra nationalist Zionist groups, uh, I I I fear that that uh, this uh, situation that that eventuality might not be avoidable because uh, you know ethnic cleansing of some sorts is happening right before our own eyes. Uh, yeah. Just uh, one just... one point. Uh... Uh, Persis, if you, if you, if yeah, you... go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so there is a logistical problem for ethnic cleansing of uh, of Gaza. Israel does. Uh, Gaza has a border, a very tiny border with Egypt, uh, that is being walled off. Egypt is building a big wall to prevent anybody from crossing it. And uh, there is a Mediterranean Sea, and then there is Israel proper. Uh, if they want to send them to West Bank, they have to go through Israel. And does really Israel want 2 million Palestinians added to the uh, uh, around uh, 5 million West Bank uh, residents, uh, Arab residents? I don't think so. Uh, so, uh, and the United States is against it. The European Union is against it. At least they had the courage to, uh, uh, to voice their opinion on this issue. Um, and I, 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 I don't think that is possible. I cannot see how they can... Uh, evacuate uh, uh, two million people. That's why, uh, if I may add, persons uh, to that, uh, King Abdullah of Jordan was uh, visiting Washington two weeks ago, and he said to the president, you know, Biden, that look, of uh, eleven million people that we have in Jordan, one in four living in Jordan is Palestinian. <laughs> we are talking about three to four million Palestinians in Jordan. We don't have the space to adopt two point two million. Uh, uh, refugees from from Gaza and Egyptians have been vehemently against any opening from Rafah to their uh, you know Sinai Desert. They simply are trapped and 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 they have in no man's land and they have no place to go. And Israelis are pushing them from North Gaza to South. Now they are asking them to actually leave Gaza Rafah and go to where you know where where they're supposed to go. Are they going to push them back, as Professor Behu said, back to West Bank? And West Bank already is in an economic decay, and they cannot even uh, handle their economic issues. They cannot. Uh, uh, they cannot be host to 2.2 million refugees, and so this is really yeah. the reason that Israelis are stuck in this mod is because there is no clear plan or a strategy for the morning after. And, you know, Ehud Barak was on some kind of news. He was saying that he knows some military folks within the, uh, the Netanyahu cabinet have told him that in the last three months or four months, we have not seen any strategy or plan for the day after, for the morning after. There is no strategy. Nobody knows exactly what are you going to do with this, you know, five, you know, 1.4 million stock in Rafah, I mean, that's the problem. Um, I just also want to remind the folks that are here today that the strategy of starving people to death and depriving them of water and depriving them of shelter, it becomes a de facto uh, condition for death on top of the bombardment. And there have been quite a few statistics put out by uh, the World Health Organization and other, um, you know, charity organizations that are suggesting that within six months, um, a large number of the population will starve to death, which is unthinkable, right? The technology, I think the other thing, Mahmoud, to your point, is not only is it a repeat of Dar Yassin and uh, the 48 ethnic cleansing of Palestine in the creation of Israel, the technologies of this are so vastly different. You know, bombardment every day, starving people, depriving people of medical care and, and aid from outside. So it's a kind of conflation of all these things. Yes, to persons to echo your sentiment, New York Times reported this past Sunday that six or nine children died on uh, one day in uh, uh, in uh, Gaza because of uh, 
in Rafah because of dehydration and also starvation. This, yeah. this happens on one day. And they were all children. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the last question, and then I want you to uh, feel free to end with any thoughts you have. Um, this is, uh, if we could wind the clock back sort of question. Uh, given that Israel's reaction has been a political and military disaster, how should they have responded? How should have Israel responded to the Hamas terror attack of October 7th? What response would have been effective? The most effective thing Israel can do is to end the occupation uh, uh, and remove the cause of all of these conflicts. Uh, but on the October 7 in particular, uh, with this type of government, with Netanyahu, uh, so revengeful, uh, and uh, the right-wing extremists in his cabinet, uh, I think this is the only thing they could have come up, come up with. Uh, maybe if there was a more sober uh, mainstream Israeli leader, they would have bombed, then they would have open negotiations very early on for the free to free the hostages, and they would have given some concessions, and they have moved forward with ending the occupation. The problem is the occupation. The problem, the, the, the reason Hamas has people who listen, who listen to it is the occupation. Uh, the reason that uh, the Palestinian Authority is losing support is because it is collaborating with the Israeli government it is corrupt and Hamas is replacing it in the hearts and minds of Palestinians under occupation. The occupation ends, if the occupation ends, that would be the beginning of the process of healing and removing these radicals from the scene and the cause for uh, this type of conflicts. Um, I echo the same sentiment. And look, from the realist point of view, if your country is attacked, you have the right to uh, to respond. So Israelis had to respond. But this is one side of the issue that we should not conflate with the reality of what happens. Look what Israelis have done to the Palestinians. They have criminalized nonviolent resistance, which is called, you know, a BDS, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction. You know, they have criminalized that. They have put the pressures on the USA to pass a law so that everybody who supports BDS, you know, I, you know, nine University of California are under pressure to revise the certain, you know, laws and rules that they have so that BDS is not something that is advocated by them. Secondly, there are, you know, unprovoked settler violence all over the place. There are some cabinet members in the uh, Biden administration, uh, sorry, in the, uh, in, uh, in the Netanyahu administration that are talking about going back to Gaza and build settlements in Gaza. Already, they're talking about expansion of that. When you look at all of these things, when you put all of these factors together, you really leave Palestinians with no other choice but violent resistance. And I'm not here to actually support violent, you know, uh, violent means of, of actually uh, bringing the world attention to your sufferings. But, the, you know, look at the Palestinians. What, what kind of remedies, what kind of, they don't have any legal remedies available to them. International community has actually forgotten. They have become dispensable members of international community. Nobody is supporting them. Even the Arabs prior to October 7th, they were actually entering into serious normalization negotiations without putting on table one condition, which is, look, as long as the Palestinians' aspirations for statehood are not recognized, we are not willing to normalize our relationship. They should have done that. But as Professor Behrouz rightly articulated that, now the equation has changed. Now the Saudis are actually issuing very strong warnings about the fact that the Palestinian issue should be put on the agenda, should be put on the table. Sometimes I feel Palestinians have no other choice but to 
resist and that resistance if it is not non-violent if you know if non-violent uh, resistance is you know criminalized i don't think what other options they have available to them um i guess my final thought would be on that note when you think about the massive destruction of gaza and the terrible loss of life i mean whole families wiped out do you see a new generation of Hamas fighters or people who who they themselves believe that the only way forward is to use violence to change the equation. I mean, of course, I mean, uh, of course, Persis. I mean, look at the Vietnam War. Every time the Americans killed the civilian population, they created more Viet Cong. Look at the war in Afghanistan. Every time the Soviet Union attacked, uh, uh, they created more Mujahideen. I mean, th this is the logic of this type of conflicts. Violence begets violence. Uh, and if there is no solution to the problem, and the only, uh, the only thing you have is violence, of course they will find a way. The weaker party will always find a way to fight back. Yes, uh, Persis, I remember that I, you know, something like 10 or 15 years ago, I read an article in Times Magazine, uh, uh, New York Times uh, Magazine, an article written by an Israeli security member. The gist of the article was that this security guy goes into the Palestinian home and he's looking for the big brother who Palestinian, who, who Israelis call a terrorist. And he sees that a couple of children, brothers, little brothers there, and he's asking for the big brother because he's there to arrest the guy, the terrorist, the so-called terrorist. And he writes in his memoir, he says that, you know, I'm not worried about the big brother because I can, I can, I can, I can find the big brother here at this home or somewhere else. I can arrest the guy. I am worried about these three, four little kids who are here and 20 years from now, I should come to arrest them. This is an article written by a Palestinian security agent who says, look, you know, I am capturing the big brother in front of their eyes. What do I expect? The three little brothers at some point are going to be the new terrorists. And you know what? I have been back. I should be back to capture them. This is a security dilemma that Israelis are chasing their tail around a circle because they are not addressing head on the issue of occupation. Okay, um, the last thought I leave you with or question is, what can Americans do to impact the future outcome of this crisis, if anything? Do you think calling Biden or the non-committed vote that was just happening in Michigan means anything in this uh, scenario? It could make only things worse, doesn't it? I mean, uh, if Biden loses, uh, I, I'm not going to even get into that. But uh, a practical suggestion I would give is to try to strengthen the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Um, uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, the squad, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, in our own uh, uh, state, uh, Barbara Lee, uh, these, are the, these are the people you, you want to have, you ought to have in the Congress to be the voice of reason and nonviolence and peace. Uh, change will come gradually, of course, but the, to, to, bring it, to bring about the change, uh, that is the way to do it, I, I believe. A, a, a capable uh, senator uh, uh, who was just nominated for the Republican seat uh, uh, for the Democratic seat for the Senate, uh, Schiff, Schiff uh, uh, he refuses to call for ceasefire. 
after all the killings, he refuses to call for ceasefire. But a person like Bernie Sanders, very early on, after some hesitation, he did call for ceasefire. So you have to find your like-minded candidate and uh, try to promote him or her uh, in the Congress, because I don't think you will get a like-minded person uh, for the presidency, not yet at least, not with this political system, not with these two political parties. Yes, you are absolutely correct. The uh, non-committal vote in Michigan came down to 13%. That is about a slightly more than 100,000 votes uh, in Michigan that did not actually went for Biden. Biden can afford to move on in the, you know, uh, elections like this, but not in general election, because Michigan is a suing state. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, those states, you have to win those states if you want to win the election. And I think Biden administration has to be very sensitive. As far as what can we do on this side of the, uh, the, the world, yes, support politicians, congressmen, congresswomen, who also are in favor of two-state solution. Support uh, the academics or experts or writing articles. Don't be intimidated by criticizing Israel because look, as a political scientist, I can criticize Saudi, I can criticize El Sisi in Egypt, I can criticize the King of Jordan, I can criticize you know uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia. But the moment I criticize Israeli officials, I'm being accused of anti-Semitism. We should not allow this confusion to prevent us to be outspoken about the realities of what is happening on the ground. The American public is awakening, and I see that they are actually openly talking about, you know, support for the Palestinians' aspirations. And I think this is the time to do that, especially in light of the fact that a very important election is ahead of us. I think it's important to support democratic side of this struggle, because I don't think any Republicans, I've seen many of the Republicans coming out and speaking about the situation in Gaza. With that, I want to thank you both very much for your time and for lending your expertise and knowledge. And I want to thank our audience for hanging with us until uh, six o'clock. And um, we'll keep talking about this. And thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.